here we are. At last, Palm Sunday, the entrance to Jerusalem is right in front of us. The jubilant entry, people waving their palms overhead. Our goal for all of Lent was to get to Jerusalem, and finally here we see it. There, we're going to go into Jerusalem this week. But amidst the praising of Jesus, the extravagant palm fronds waving in the air, the processional march, there's still a malaise, a cloud of unease that hovers over the whole proceedings. If you listened carefully to our scripture lessons this morning, you may have been surprised how different Luke's version of these events truly is. There are no palm branches in Luke. In fact, they only appear explicitly in John's Gospel. Mark has leafy branches, but doesn't specify as palm branches. Palm branches are from John alone. Instead, in Luke, the people just shut off their cloaks and place them before Jesus. These cloaks that have protected them from sun and from rain are now laid before Jesus as he rides out of Bethany. Indeed, while we usually think of the disciples entering the city to acclaim Jesus riding on the donkey, Luke doesn't even let us glimpse Jerusalem until after all the pomp and circumstance have been lifted up. Until after all of this is done, do we finally enter into Jerusalem, even see Jerusalem in Luke's Gospel. Here, Jesus rides on a colt. Now, the Hebrew word means male, child of any beast of burden. It might very well be a donkey, but Luke doesn't specify. He just says a colt. A colt that has been tied up in town. Now, the, the disciples, they show up. They say, hey, the master needs this donkey, and they take the donkey away from its owners. And somewhat miraculously, that's enough. I think that's a surprise. Perhaps the owners of that donkey are excited that Jesus chose to ride this donkey into town. Hey, Jesus is riding our donkey. That's pretty cool. Perhaps they knew the prophecy from Zechariah chapter 9 that the Messiah would ride on a young donkey. Possible. But I think it's more likely that they didn't want to displease a powerful person. After all, at this time in history, it was usually the Romans who were referred to as master, as in, the master needs this. It was the Romans who had the power, the Romans who were in charge of society. And no one in their right mind wants to displease the Romans, this occupying power. Look, Governor Pilate himself was in town, in Jerusalem, uh, along with at least one entire legion of soldiers, about a thousand men. Okay, the estimates range from 800 to 1,200, but go with me here, about 1,000 in this legion. Now, it takes a big to-do, a big to-do, for Pilate to leave that fancy governor's palace at Caesarea Philippi, on the coast, north of modern Tel Aviv. So what was this big to-do that was going on? Well, of course, it was the Passover celebration, the Passover celebration in Jerusalem. Every year, the Jewish people remember the exodus from Egypt and the plagues that finally convinced Pharaoh to let them go. Remember, the last of those plagues was the plague of the firstborn, where every firstborn son in Egypt would be killed, except if the home had the blood of a sacrificed lamb painted over the, the lintel of the door. These homes were passed over by the angel of death. And only these homes were passed over. That's why in English we call this celebration the Passover. As a result, Pharaoh finally acknowledged the power of the Holy One and let the Hebrew people go. Egypt's empire was powerful. While the Hebrews were slaves and had no training in war, yet God created a situation that could lead them out of Egypt. God led them out of Egypt, out of oppression, and into the crucible of the wilderness that created a whole people from disparate families. Now, a thousand years or so after this, in Jesus' day, the role of evil empire was being played by the Romans. We see this re repetition through history that empires rise and fall, and that people are oppressed throughout history in different times and places. Well, in Jesus' day, the evil empire was the Romans. 
And so at a celebration of deliverance from oppression and death, is it any surprise that the Roman governor would take an interest? Is it any surprise that Pilate would be worried about a gathering of people celebrating freedom from oppression? Is it any surprise that the Messiah, Jesus, makes his appearance at Jerusalem at this time? No wonder the disciples were excited. Even Judas, even Judas, had to be thinking, this is it, Jesus will overthrow the Roman Empire, it's finally done, we're going to have an empire of Judaism to spread across the whole world, but here we have the Messiah. And so people are throwing off their cloaks, their protection from the elements, and spreading them before Jesus. Symbolically, this is saying, you are protection enough your God is our God, and God will save us. And what do the people shout? We think of Palm Sunday as a time of hosannas ringing out, Hosanna, Hoshiana, as we've sung in the service today. But not in Luke. In Luke, the cry is, Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven, glory in the highest. You see, Luke is echoing not just Psalm 118, Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. But also the words of the angels appearing to the shepherds in Luke chapter 2. Peace on earth, goodwill to humanity, glory in the highest heaven. Unlike Mark and Matthew, Luke is emphasizing Jesus' peaceful entry, his peaceful messiahship, what it means to be peaceful messiah. Additionally, by having the crowd change the text of the psalm to say, Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord, Luke is emphasizing just how different Jesus is from even the crowd's expectation at this point. The crowd is expecting the king to be riding in, and yet Jesus comes in humility, riding on a humble colt. Now, unlike Mark, or even Matthew, Luke gives us no indication of how Jesus feels about this whole Palm Sunday parade procession leading into the city, right up until Jesus sees the city of Jerusalem with his own eyes, crossing the crest of the Mount of Olives. And what happens when Jesus sees the city? Jesus, celebrated, beloved Jesus, weeps in anguish at the city's imminent destruction. What has been going through Jesus' mind this whole time? What was Jesus thinking as the crowds are praising him? Well, if Jesus knew of the destruction of the city years after his death and resurrection, as Luke seems to portray here, then he also likely knows his own fated death on the cross. All the things that will happen during this holy week, Jesus is likely aware of them going into the city. To that end, I imagine him remembering the words of the prophet Isaiah. Remember, it's from Isaiah's prophecies and scrolls that Jesus read and preached at age 12. Jesus knows Isaiah inside and out. Jesus knows Isaiah. And so it would not surprise me at all that he has this first-person suffering servant in mind, thinking about it as he's going into the city. The Lord God opened my ear. I didn't rebel. I didn't turn my back. Instead, I gave my body to attackers and my cheeks to beard pluckers. I didn't hide my face from insults and spitting. The Lord God will help me. Therefore, I haven't been insulted. Now, Isaiah intended these words as comfort to believers in exile, those who were persecuted. And Jesus knows that this celebration only presages his own persecution to come. Yet he comes to bring a peaceful change, a revolution away from the empire-minded world and to the equality of God's kingdom of heaven on earth. Richard Vinson, in his commentary on Luke, describes it this way. His message, in other words, was not, make me king or be destroyed by Rome. It was, be transformed by God's rule into a kingdom with no rich and no poor. No powerful and no weak. Rejecting those terms of peace meant choosing the empire instead, where inevitably 
the weak are crushed. When the Pharisees asked Jesus to get his followers to shut up, I know it's not the politest of language, but that's what's going on here, Jesus doesn't shrink away, but tells them that even the rocks would cry out if humans were silenced. He has set his face like flint toward the city of Jerusalem, and yet even that stony demeanor breaks when he sees the beauty all at once from the top of the Mount of Olives. Jesus weeps and exclaims, How I wish you knew today what would bring peace, but you can't see. What is going on here? Well, most people in Jesus' day believed that Yerushalayim, Jerusalem, Yerushalayim, meant foundation of peace and prosperity. I mean, the connection with the Hebrew word shalom, you know this word, shalom, means peace and wholeness. The connection with shalom and shalem is pretty clear. We've got the same consonants, a few odd vowels thrown in, but that's Hebrew and Aramaic for you. Aramaic, in fact, (laughs) is where shalem comes from. Aramaic meaning peace and prosperity, a little different from peace and wholeness in Hebrew. So Luke is is pointing out that the so-called foundation of peace, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, is unable to see what peace looks like. Peace is not rising up in arms against one emperor after another, one pharaoh, one Caesar, one emperor after another. Peace is not utterly destroying your enemies. As Tacitus wrote, they rob, kill, and plunder all under the deceiving name of the Roman rule. They make a desert and call it peace. Peace is seen in God's kingdom, where those that society has oppressed are lifted up, and those that society has lauded are brought down. Even Paul points this out in the Christ hymn of Philippians 2. For though he was equal with God, he took the form of a slave and submitted to death. Yes, even death on a cross. You see, Jesus riding on a donkey is proclaiming humble peace. The humble reign of God. Here, the Son of God is is not shined up, not slicked back, but merely riding on a donkey, a humble animal, into the city. The suffering servant of God, though he was equal with God, going into Jerusalem toward his own death, he embodies the spirit of Psalm 118, the spirit of Isaiah 50, the cornerstone that was rejected, now entering the gates of justice, proclaiming the glory of God, the glory of God's kingdom of heaven, which we pray this week, week in, week out, day in, day out. Your kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. What does this look like today? Even as we come closer and closer to realizing the kingdom of heaven on earth with democracy emphasizing equality, with men and women voting and serving together in leadership, with ideals of anyone being able to be the leaders of our nation and of the world, there are forces opposed to this reign. Forces which would buy leadership. Forces which are trying to coerce the world back into empire, into destruction and calling it peace, into conformity and calling it unity, into fear and anger of those who are different, who society has oppressed, who have been outcast from the conversation. When our society is as turbulent as it is today, can't you just imagine Jesus weeping over it all, saying, would that even today you knew the things that make for peace? they are hidden from your eyes. When Christians support empire, even when we laud Jesus, even when we praise Jesus, if we are supporting empire, we are preventing the kingdom of heaven from being realized in this world. We're working against God's plan. My friends, the kingdom of heaven is already here. Glory in the highest. But the kingdom is not yet fully realized. You are called to help build it, to be the disciples leading the way, dropping your cloaks of protection, placing your trust in God rather than in princes. And so, 
May you trust in God. May Jesus lead you into peace. May the Holy Spirit fill you and inspire you to build the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of peace here on earth. Amen.